Ladies and gents, please put your hands together and give a, a big white horse welcome for Mr. Dennis Collins. Thank you. Dennis Collins, a man who I've come across in the last year or two wearing many hats. Tell us, Dennis, who exactly are you? Oof, I'll give me a minute to think about that, so I'll stall for a second. <laughs> okay. And I'll say, first of all, it's an honor to be here, and, and thank you very much. And I also want to compliment the speakers uh, this evening. Uh, incredible stuff, and very interesting, and well done. Um, who am I? Um, husband and father, I suppose, first of all. Um, if I was to try to categorize myself, probably a, a realist with idealist tendencies. Okay. Lay it on top of a little New York brashness. That's good. With a sprinkle of cork rebelliousness. Wow, <laughs> that's a nice mix. Yeah, okay. So you, um, at least I've got to know of you, and Landry got to know you, through your stewardship of IT at Cork. But can you tell us about some of the other things that you, you're involved in right now? What, what, what keeps you busy? Uh, currently, um, well, uh, on, the, on the professional front, uh, I took early retirement from, from IBM a, little while, a couple of months back. I uh, had a, a long career with them, 28 years, and had a variety of, uh, I'm sure we'll delve into that a little bit, a variety of opportunity there, and ter terrific career. Um, opened up a, a, a new business called Smarter Dynamics, mm -hmm. uh, working with a lot of different con consulting um, uh, models with a variety of businesses. Um, on the um, external front, been involved with IT at Cork, trying to help uh, uh, companies and make a difference for the region. Also on the board of uh, the, the Cork Chamber, uh, and up to not too, in the last couple of years, I was uh, a very proud um, uh, basketball coach for my, okay. my son's team in, in Mallow, sure. and so who's here tonight. Great. Um, we all can hear the accent, and I think many people can, will probably see you as an American. And I'm sure- A big American. Yeah. <laughs> if, <laughs> but if you went back to New York, pretty much everyone would say, hey, that's, here's Irish, or here's Collins, an Irish guy. Tell us, how, how, how do you see yourself in, in, in that? No, very definition. much American first. So I would probably consider myself um, uh, an American in Ireland first, mm -hmm. and, and you know it's interesting. Um, you know when you're living in America, you, we've had this conversation. You're considered uh, Irish, and then when you come back here, you're considered American. So there's kind of a dichotomy there. But um, I would very much consider myself an American living here, though having been here a while and having gone back a lot over the years, back and forth. Where I, was, I had a, came here as a kid into West Cork quite often, and then. Um, I um, always had a house here in, in North Cork, so I kind of um, knew the area, knew it, but I don't, you don't really know a place till you live in it, because right. you have a lot of people, you know, whether they were raised in England or raised in America and had Irish parents, and you go back and forth and quite often, um, and you think you know it, you're close, but um, not till you live in it, so I, th I think I'm very comfortable here, I feel mm -hmm. a part of it. Um, in fact, probably a good example is, I don't know if anyone's read uh, McCarthy's Bar by Pete McCarthy, it's a great book. So when you mm. ask me the question, what's the latest book? I'm cutting to the chase. That's the one oh, yeah, I've probably really? read in the last year <laughs> if you ask me that. But um, fantastic. Yeah. And very witty guy, very funny, great read. Probably one of the top 10 books I've, I've ever yeah. read. Like, wow. um, and tells a great story, Helen. Yeah. And, um, but he also has, I think, one of the parents English, one is Irish, but came back to Dunmanway or somewhere in West Cork. Mm. And so he's got... He's really got the understanding of it, but he's just maybe that one half a step removed, and that would probably be, be a, a probably good uh, yeah, analogy for me right. using yeah. the Pete McCarthy thing. Yeah. Does that make sense? You know, as you were saying that, um, it struck me to talk about the differences between New York and North Cork, but actually a more interesting question might be, what are the similarities between North Cork and, and the Bronx? Um, you know, the Bronx, when I grew up, um, was great. I had a great childhood. You know, it was uh, probably similar to Kilburn or Cricklewood type of area maybe 30 years ago or whatever. Um, but uh, uh, we, we, growing up there, we very much had the ethos of family, parish, 
country. And if you kind of lived with that type of thought process and how you behaved and how you acted um, and worked, um, you generally succeeded or came out on top or had a, a pleasant experience. It doesn't always work. Yeah. So I, I find in, in, in Ireland in general, but in the North Cork where I am now, there, there's, there's the very similar, a lot of similarities there, very community yeah. driven. Um, you know, we, it's sometimes if you're on top, it's not the best. There's sometimes a little bit of people want to bring you down, but, but when, you're, when things are tough, there's, there's no better place that people want to kind of help you out. So I'd say that's a very strong similarity. Yeah. So tell us, how was it that you were born in the Bronx? Tell us about your parents and your ancestors and so on. And so kind of I am like? um, born, raised in the Bronx. Um, um, immigrant parents. My mother was from Canada. My father was from, from Ireland. Um, three sisters, yeah. Kathleen, Mary, and Eileen. So, kind of traditional names. Yeah. Um, my, um, my parents immigrated there and settled in, in, in the Bronx, in um, St. Philip Neary Parish, mm -hmm. and, went, and you know, went from there. Okay. Similar story to a lot of people, whether they went to England, Australia, or, or you know, uh, America, sure. New York. Sure. And tell us about, about growing up there. Um, did you feel conscious of your immigrant status, or was, it, was that really the no. norm? It, where we were, yeah. it was the norm. Yeah. It was kind of when you got old, a little bit older and you started going to other areas, you would be like, oh, you know, yeah. this is America. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, uh, we, the, the neighborhood was primarily Irish and Italian, very Catholic. Um, mm. there, there probably would have been differences between even those. They're, they're, really? they're living in separate, you know, going to school together, but living in separate neighborhoods within yeah. the parish kind of thing. But... Um, uh, not till you got older would you really more acknowledge that or be aware of it. Really. And tell, uh, talk to us about school. Were you uh, a good kid in school or were you a messer? Ish. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd say I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't the best student, mm -hmm. I'd say, even throughout my, my whole um, academic career. You know, mm -hmm. I, got, I, I, I did reasonably well. I wouldn't say I was the, the uh, brightest kid in the class, mm -hmm. but um, uh, it was great. Um, Great schooling systems. Uh, I went mm -hmm. to Catholic school primarily, and you know it was tough. You know, yeah. It was very strict, but uh, it, it served it served us and, and me well for for adulthood, having you know a sense of discipline and sense of fair play. And you know, okay. there was a downside to all of that, which you, a lot yeah. of people can get into. But uh, from a positive standpoint, to give you a sense of fair play, think, think about the community, think about mm -hmm. doing the right thing, but and try to apply that in the business world. Yeah. So what about the business world? When you were growing up as a as a boy, what what kind of things did you did you dream about becoming when you grew up? I, so I wanted to be a cop. Okay. I wanted to be an NYPD. I wanted to be a policeman. Nothing better. That's what I wanted to to, to be. So that yeah. was my dream for many many years, and um, I took the test actually for the NYPD, you know, and I went through a lot a majority of that process, and but then I also had gotten. Um, some work working for, for IBM and working in the computer room and pulling cables, started okay. from the bottom, and worked yeah. in the mail room and worked yeah. my way up and all. And I, I but I, uh, I, I got a sense of, of technology yeah. and what it could do and things were starting to kind of take mm. off then in the, you know, right. the late 80s and into the 90s. Yeah. So um, my passion um, kind of uh, got inspired and um, that, so I went, I went in that direction. Yeah. I'm, I know it, certainly in the summer it, it's, more than hot enough, but when you were 12 years old on September, whatever it was, 19, whatever, were you wearing short pants? Can you remember on that day? I need help here, guys. <laughs> I don't know where to go with this There's one. There's no catch. No, because I, I, I saw oh, you fiddling earlier, yeah, so I don't know where you're going oh, with this. <laughs> so here's the deal. So here's that 12 year old kid sitting in his short pants, sitting on the sidewalk. What kind of stuff would you say to him now, knowing what was ahead of him? Hmm. Maybe not as much 12, maybe a bit older, mm -hmm. right? Because 12, I was probably still playing stickball and sure. whatever on the block and whatever. Um, I probably would tell a little bit older person, or even the young man, um, don't be in such a hurry. Mm. You know, I think I was very driven when I was younger, wanted to be successful, wanted to, you know, create wealth and um, make things happen, which, which, which stimulates me getting results for, for a lot of different things, not just for business. 
Um, but I'd probably say slow down, smell the roses a little bit. Uh, there's a lot more to life, and um, you'll get there. Mm. Just you know, take a minute and, st and smell the roses a bit. I probably mm. would tell them. Mm. Have you been smelling roses in recent years? Yeah, I have. Have you? <laughs> I have. Um, still work hard, mm. but you know, in recent years, have said you know what you know. There's, there's, Work-life balance is important. Still got to be successful. Still got to work hard. I mean, put in a lot of hours over the years to try and be successful. Um, but you know, there's, there's there's definitely a balance to it all. Yeah, yeah, fair play to you. Um, so when you look at what you're doing today in this, um, let's say, post-corporate existence that you're, you're in now, what's kind of important to you? My family, that's been a constant, so that's not any new, new thing. Um, very proud of all my children. Um, proud of my wife, who's an uh, intensive care nurse in, in CUH, and I've seen her in action a few times in my life. And you know, the first responders are the real okay. heroes in this world um, on the great things that they do, and I admire them, what they accomplish. Um, so I, I, I get also um, a great sense of accomplishment with some of the in recent years where maybe we've had a little more time or influence to try mm -hmm. and make things happen with a lot of the objectives that we've been involved um, um, with the European tech cluster along uh, CSR stuff working mm -hmm. with a variety of whether it be charities or social change um, sure. to make a difference so since even the post well I've kind of really kept Probably the same amount of focus, but I think I'm just enjoying it a lot more because um, uh, maybe I have a little bit more time. Yeah, yeah. You're smelling more roses. Yeah. Yeah. But, so, like, you are visible a lot in the media. Mm -hmm. You're definitely visible in the business world, kind of banging a drum for the tech industry mm -hmm. and also the region. Mm -hmm. So where do you see all that going right now? I mean, you've been involved in this for a while. What, what's your vision for what, what's coming on? The for course? the Cork region, for yeah. industry? And yeah, yeah. Both. Let's start with it, that, that kind of tech game and where, okay, where do you so, see it about? So the, the first thing that we started several years ago to make a difference for the region was to, cr to create a story, but, and, and, but also create collaborative leadership. Um, and it, I did it in a very, we did it in a very prescriptive way. And the, the, the first thing to do was to create a vision. And the vision, and which is also your elevator pitch, kind of, when someone says, you know, what are you up to, was to create um, an industry-led movement, coalition of the willing, as it were, that successfully integrated government, public sector, and academia to drive social, commercial, and academic results. So that was the broad vision. And we started going on that journey and, and bringing people along. So there was a lot of the elements of the speakers tonight, tonight was part of it. There yeah. was failure, there was storytelling, mm -hmm. um, there was academia part of it, and, 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 a, and a movement. So uh, that started getting success. And it required a lot of things to do. You had to get people thinking together. You had to have the right focus. You had to get the media and the PR to get attention mm -hmm. to it. Um, so that has become successful to a certain level, and we're seeing a lot of success from it. So now translate that to, to the broader region. Yeah. Um, I think this region is incredible. I love living here uh, on, on so many levels, the people, the, the um, uh, quality of life, uh, the rain, I don't know, sometimes the weather, <laughs> I don't know, man, it's yeah. a bit challenging at times. But you know, there's always a fly in the ointment, right? right. And that's part of life. Yeah. Um, but I do think the, to the topology of the, the region, you know, the, the, you know, the rivers, the mountains, the fields, the cities, mm -hmm. um, it has every characteristic of in the entire country here, as well as every characteristic that most people on the globe would want. Yeah. And when you combine that with the level of um, uh, Fortune 100 type of multinationals that are here, and then you combine that with the uh, surge of a lot of the people even in this audience of, uh, of indigenous business and small and medium enterprise, it's incredible. So I do think what the theme of work, learn, live, yeah. if we combine that successfully from a branding perspective, we can really grow it further. So I, I think 
they're, they're, this is a nation of parishes, right? Yeah. So, and then Cork is, is a, a nation of a nation of parishes on right. its own. So there's a real element of politics and all of this that you have to get through for a common goal. But I do think the way we're primed from a business standpoint, from a topology standpoint, from an, um, uh, a, a political standpoint, that we, we can go incredible yeah. places. Uh, I, I also think that, you know, you're never going to be Dublin, right? So I'm a New Yorker, yeah. right? Right? Boston is Boston, New York is New York, but Boston markets itself a certain way. So we could market ourselves in a complementary fashion. Yeah. And frankly, the, the profile and the audience of the people that um, would want to come here, whether it be for foreign direct investment or start up, use a startup or come and go to school or, or whatever, um, it's probably geared more to the Silicon Valley type of guy yeah. because he, he would want to come to a place like that versus in living in Dublin. Mm -hmm. So both areas have tremendous things to offer. It, it's a, and, and it's important messaging. that It's a complementary strategy. So to, I rambled a bit, but uh, to, to net it out, I think we have the attributes uh, of incredible success and we just need to horizontally all kind of get together and drive it for, for increased um, investment and, and success. Give me, give me a sense, because I, I hear it in what you're saying, that you have a feeling of kind of unfulfilled potential for the region. Mm -hmm. So give me a sense, like on a scale of one to 10, just to put a structure on that, 10 being like the ultimate realization of what's possible, one being, you know, kind of inward looking and going nowhere. Where, where do you think we are and where do you think we could be Probably in, at in five term. to six, and we mm -hmm. could be at a hundred. Yeah, okay. Don't limit it at ten. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, I, I think there are very specific things we could do. There's a lot of things being talked about mm. and starting to move along. I think there's a lot of great groups doing great things. So it's not just about me and all yeah. the things I'm doing. I'm just part of a of a group of people trying to make a difference. But uh, I, I think one thing we could it's specific to the IT industry. I do think we could. Um, create like a digital quarter or an innovation quarter. If you see how in, in South Market Street in San Francisco, the way tr Twitter has transformed um, that in San Francisco, in the city area, we we're, 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 the, the, re the, the, the opera is popping up and things like that. So there's the knock-on effect. So I do think there's a, an opportunity where, you know, you call it a smart city, smart specialization, digital quarter, dig innovation quarter, where you know, like Barcelona has created themselves, you know, the mobile, the mobility type of city, right? That's mm -hmm. the branding they're doing. So I think we should create our digital quarter where we can integrate IT companies, small and medium business, um, RTE. RTE has, a, has, mm -hmm. a, has, a, has their Cork um, regional thing here. So transmedia, mm -hmm. uh, you got gaming and Blizzard and like brown bag and guys mm -hmm. like that happen in a, in a country. So first thing, if we created this type of quarter, maybe, you know, take a NAMA building or, mm -hmm. and invest in it and let some space be open to, kit it out, some space open for SMEs to flourish, space for multinationals, media, and it would just kind of, you know, do it maybe down by... Um, that would roll into the docklands, you know, do it in an urban area um, near the Elysian or, you mm -hmm. know, some area like mm -hmm. that. And all of a sudden, you know, more people go into the pubs and the restaurants mm -hmm. and the cleaners and all of that yeah. stuff. So uh, I think a digital quarter would be very, very, very important. Uh, second thing I think is um, the convention center. We've been mm -hmm. talking about that for a long time. I think if we figure out a way to make that happen, um, that would be incredibly important. Um, third, um, Probably maybe tier one data center space, which we're mm. challenging with a bit to get kind of the, uh, the, big, the big companies to kind of come in mm. to, to bolster over all that. So I think if we, um, if we did that, we're, we'd be having a balanced approach of bringing in industries that would grow, helping small and medium business grow. So you'd have the FDI and the, and the, and the SMEs going up and then Having a convention center would be a draw for, uh, for all non-industry. You have Elton John or whatever, mm. have a concert. Um, uh, actually, the last thing which I didn't mention I think is important is also um, the airport. Mm. We need to figure out a way. I know there's a, lot of, there's a huge amount of debt and there's structures with Dublin and all that. But uh, where we get you know, transatlantic flights, you know, it's New York, Boston, San Francisco, whatever, start. Mm. As well as Cork Dublin route, as well as some key across Europe. So we can bring them in, we have a convention center, and then we have a digital uh, innovation hub. So I, that's, 
If we did that, I think that would really, really drive it. Because you, you have the academic, yeah, academic uh, mm -hmm. great universities here, and it would all kind of tie together. So you're kind of painting, you're blending an awful lot of progress that has been made in recent years with some projects that are ongoing or possible. But I'm curious, from your personal experience now in heading up an, a lot of the stuff within that, where are the obstacles? Where are the, the challenges, let's say, and, and right down to you know, cohorts of people versus structures? And wh where do you see the, the stuff that we could take care of easily, let's say? Well, let's, let's, let's talk about what worked first, mm. and then I'll talk about that if you don't mind. So we, we have followed and I have followed a very prescriptive model to get the level of success that we've had. And again, I don't want to be overselling how great we were. We've got some good stuff going, mm -hmm. a lot of people doing good stuff. So I want to make sure I'm being humble <laughs> enough about that, not talking too big. But um, when dealing with people, three very focused streams sitting down. Uh, first, if, if there's something we're trying to accomplish, um, we have a conversation about that. And sometimes it's people bringing an idea forward and we're working on it, or sometimes we're trying to go move something out uh, amongst the region. Is you, you sit down with the people who are gonna work with you on it, and you either explain to them, or, in, or it's a two-way conversation, where what we're doing, why is it important to the industry, or the region, or the people, or et cetera, right? Second thing is, you have a conversation with them, why is this important to the company, that you own or the company that you work for or whatever your business interest is. And then the third thing is you have the conversation, what's in it for you? Mm. You've already described what you're up to, the what's in it for when they're looking at you at that mm -hmm. point. Um, and when you blend all of those together, whether it's in a business environment when you're paying someone who works for you or works with you, or you're doing it on um, a volunteer basis, uh, I have found it, it will be equally successful when you combine all that. It, crea it creates passion, mm -hmm. uh, it, it creates sustainability, and it creates results. So that's what's working. Okay? The inhibitors quite often, um, like in anything, um, is people don't like change, right? So you have to kind of work through that natural human behavior. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, as Tip O'Neill said, all, all politics is local, sure. right? So there's uh, uh, an angle of different people have different interests, which is important. That's what makes the world go around. So you need to crack that code with those three prescriptive streams. Yeah. Um, funding. Funding is very important, trying to get things done. Um, well, those are probably the three, I would say, the three main inhibitors to get things accomplished. Um, how easier is it, because people say this all the time, and, and in fact it goes out in, 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 in the business world, you can get great access to the political system here, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, it's a selling point to, to companies that are investing in Ireland by, by the week. What's your direct experience uh, on that topic compared to your experience in, in the US? Let's I say? think it's very true. It is a very strong selling proposition for the country and the region. Um, you can, you can, wouldn't say, v sometimes it's not very easily, but fairly mm. easily um, get to the right person, whether it be through the IDA or Enterprise Ireland, who I do think do a fantastic job for, mm. for the country. Uh, getting to the right minister, um, things of that nature, public sector people. I, and I do think there, on average, there's a very strong willingness to help if you have the right story, have the right proposition, um, people are focused on it. So I, I think it, 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 it does exist, and it's a very strong uh, proposition for the country. We often hear, and, and I see a lot of it uh, online and social media channels, people kind of commenting, a lot of a bit, bit cynical, a bit negative, um, at times about, yeah, 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 or, oh, there they go again doing that or whatever. And I'm sure you, you, you come across that kind of negativity, let's call it that. But what's your personal response to stuff like that? Do you tend to just, uh, you know, just ignore it, or do you tend to engage with so that, that kind of stuff? You, you, now I'll ask you the question. Give me more. Where, <laughs> yeah. where are you going? Name with names. Um, just, uh, just uh, maybe ask the question again. No. So it's like any any 
initiative or anything that, that is, seems to be presented, there are always a certain yeah. percentage of people that, for maybe entirely valid reasons or whatever so the negative reasons, reasons negativity will, will start thing? challenging it or will start kind of yeah. criticizing people involved. And I'm sure anyone, as you've explained, anyone trying to initiate change will always meet resistance in different forms. But what's your typical response to it? Is it to, to take it on or just to kind of well, work so my it? first comment on that is I do find there's probably a higher propensity for that here than in the States. Mm -hmm. I think people are probably a little more positive for things sometimes. And maybe sometimes it might be too much, right? right. So there's probably a balance in between the two. But um, uh, you do find that and the begrudgery to sometimes just, just to be straight uh, is it can be challenging. Um, it's all, probably everybody here has heard it, so if I repeat, my, repeating something you heard, my apologies in advance, but I don't know if it was Bono or somebody who was saying the difference between America and Ireland is when you're looking at the guy with the big house at the top of the hill, and in America they say, one day I'm going to be that guy, and in Ireland they say, one day I'm going to get that. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know? yeah. So um, I have found that. Um, and what you... What you there's, it depends. I mean, there's multiple leadership styles that you have to engage in to try to be a successful leader and, you know, use them at different times. Um, sometimes people just don't understand what you're trying to do. And then that's your fault for not communicating effectively. Or you haven't engaged in that three stream okay. conversation because you've either been too busy or whatever. Um, so you, 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 you really want to, you got to be patient and the, the, the guy looking back 20 years ago, 25 years ago, probably been, would have been more bullheaded and gone right at it. Mm. But the older I get, the more I realize, in, in, like in baseball, you need to have multiple pitches or in cricket or sure. googly or whatever. Yeah. So sometimes you got to have a fastball, sometimes you have a curveball, sometimes you have a changeup. So you have to um, work with different people in different ways. So um, I would address it head on, but head on might be around the back door. So head on yeah. is probably the wrong way to explain it. it, kind of depends. And then sometimes there's people you just say tough right. and you ignore them or you yeah. just powder through because yeah. you're never gonna get anything done if you're worried about everybody. Right. So you just make sure you try to engage all the right people, you be professional, you be honest, you have integrity, you bring your story and your vision together through those three streams. Again, it's in a business environment or in a volunteer um, social environment and um, and, you know, sometimes it's just like, sorry, we don't agree, but we're still friends, but, you know, okay. I'm moving on. Okay. You talked there about leadership style, and I'm curious, you probably have learned a lot uh, from working with uh, a lot of good people, both in the region here and also in your IBM career. Mm -hmm. What would those people who've worked with you describe as your leadership style? What was different about you? Some you might not want to hear. All right. <laughs> Maybe we do. Um, I'd say uh, collaborative. Okay. Um, one of the most actually, yeah, there's a lot of skills you need to have to work in a multinational, uh, but one of the most important skills is collaborative influence, which is a fancy way to say how do you have people that don't work with you partner with you and do mm -hmm. things with you. So uh, that, uh, I would say collaborative. I would also probably say pace setter. Okay. That's probably, you know, and even years ago, I was very driven and maybe even been too pushy at mm. times. Um, I've learned to hone that a little mm. better with just a bit of wisdom and age and probably failing and getting beat mm. up and not getting something done. You say, why, what did I do wrong here? Yeah. So, but it, primarily probably a, cl a collaborative, uh, a good communicator, um, good, good with putting vision and, and, and messaging together to get a result, driving in a collaborative fashion, but a pace setter. Like, I, 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 I will push and move things along at times faster than they should be, uh, but to, to move it along. So the, the, that would probably be what people would say. That pace saving thing is interesting because one of the phrases, or the way you described um, uh, your IBM thing, and we'll talk about that in a minute, was this concept of early retirement, mm -hmm. okay? But do you ever see yourself retiring entirely from being engaged in activity like this? Probably not. Yeah. I, I, do, I do enjoy, I, 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 you know, it's an old phrase, but I'm a people person. You know, right. I like being out there, meeting people, doing, yeah. doing things, getting things done. 
results oriented. I'll have to get okay. you know whether whatever the role, result is. So probably not. I probably think I'll always have my finger in doing something. And a few pies. Yeah. Yeah. There's some good pies around. Even my yeah. son or some of the kids say, which I have gotten better, and I do hill walking and some of that. But like that, sure. you got to get a hobby. Oh, really? You know, like they're always. <laughs> Well, the other thing they said to me tonight, I'm going on a tangent a little bit. I won't say which kid said it. And they were like, well, what, are you, what are you doing tonight? And I'm like, oh, not, like, nothing. And what is it? They're asking your opinion. And, and then they're like, why? Why, why do they want you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's yeah. the best thing with kids. They keep you grounded. They you really know? They're like, I, they, don't, they don't get it. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I think I'll always be, in, I'll stay active. Yeah, yeah. So t t talk us through some of the, the factors that... That led you to, which is a huge decision this year, to, did you say 28 years you were mm -hmm. involved with, with IBM? To kind of move from that uh, world into this new phase that, that you're in. What, what kind of stuff? You know, it's been on, on my mind for years. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of, I've been kind of planning it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and the right moment came along for some external opportunities, mm -hmm. um, as well as uh, uh, there was probably an element of, um, some opportunities coming open with, with my company to go back to the States and that mm -hmm. probably wasn't on the cards and family is happily settled here and this is mm -hmm. where we're committing our life at this mm -hmm. time. So putting that all together, opportunity plus life cycle plus um, uh, you know, quality of life. That kind of that all kind of came together. But you know, it just didn't happen overnight. Yeah. You know, and it's it's probably another piece of advice if I can just give it you know I, I follow I've always tried to follow the 80 20 rule okay. when I do anything right and that's in, in business when you get close to getting you know things done but as well as with your own career and your own or your own company you know you even with some of the external things that I've done I've we've, we've done some great things but there's also been a 20 percent element that was selfish to be honest so I do think you need to keep your eye on the ball on those things and when you can combine business result and a social result with something that's good for you personally, it's a, it's a home run because people will embrace you for mm -hmm. it. But it also makes you marketable for your next opportunity. And in this, the way the globalization and the market is right now, you got to be kind of quick on your feet. So um, I, I had an element of that where my 80-20 rule probably opened up some doors or some opportunities for me um, that when the timing came together that I was able to utilize. Sure. So tell us about some of the, the projects you're involved in now. I know you're chairing a, essentially a startup, if we can describe it as that. Yep. Um, and so t tell us about so one of the So one of the, you know, towards the, 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 the back end of my career um, with IBM was involved with a lot of credible stuff and um, more, some on the data center, but on the mobility and the analytics front. Um, analytics is just, it's exploding. Yeah. I mean, it's just so interesting. But... It's been around forever. When you were listening to one of the stories tonight about the doctor um, in, in, in England and 100 years ago when he was looking at the percentage, that's analytics, yeah. right? So it's sure. you know, leveraging that so you should wash your hands. Yeah. So I find that incredibly yeah. um, interesting. Uh, and it's, there's, it's gonna go in a lot of different directions um, on you know, the internet of things, you know, how, how do you leverage the data, how do you use the data, how do you prescriptively predict things uh, it's just fascinating stuff that gives me a passion. And there's um, uh, um, a local company here, a startup called LearnLoad, which is very focused on um, software as a service, focused on um, knowledge management and analytics. Okay. Um, primarily right now looking at um, you know, uh, tech centers, call centers, um, uh, inbound, outbound, uh, BPOs which there's a lot of in, in, in Ireland and in Europe, sure. but the, it could pivot in a lot of different directions. So mm -hmm. we're really excited about that. Um, what kind of things do you bring to the party for them? What, what, what kind of stuff can, can you... I think, you know, them? when you... You know, I've, I've had... I've worked in a lot of disciplines in, in my career. I worked in, you know, sales, marketing, operations, finance, product development, corporate um, things, uh, alternate channels, all, all different ways of going to market. So I think there's an element that, that I'm, I'm, I'm a very good generalist, which kind of yeah. sounds weak, but <laughs> sometimes that brings a lot to the table. I'm probably bad at a lot of things. But I, <laughs> I think um, I bring that to the table, and I think if you scratch me hard enough, who am I at the base? I'm probably you know, a sales business development type guy. Okay. And so I think I bring um, glo global experience, ability to, to kind of scale, um, 
uh, as well as some sales and business development. And I also think, you know, when I, I described myself, you know, a realist with idealist tendencies, I do like want to save the world sometimes, but that's the 20%. The 80% sure. is the realist guy. Yeah. And uh, I do, like uh, Sheryl Sandberg sa said one time of um, Google and Facebook fame, you know, done is better than perfect. Right. I do think yeah. that there's an element that sometimes mid-range companies and startups or founder, founder folks are trying to um, uh, make the perfect meal when you should be selling hot dogs. And so I think I also bring an element of, well, what are we trying to accomplish here? This doesn't have to, perfect, this doesn't have to be perfect. Let buyers buy, let's build up the business, mm -hmm. and we move it from there. So I think the, the experience, the, the realist approach, combined with some of the other things, probably add some value. That's interesting about the idealism piece, because I see you popping up in the, in the media a lot, talking about the connection between education mm -hmm. and industry and it's relevant to, to a lot of even the things that P.O. was saying earlier. Yeah. Um, and I, I get this, this sense from you that you're, I won't say pissed off, but you're, you're kind of frustrated at, at things that could be done better and so on. So what kind of things are, are well, firing you in? So I think there is, and this is not just an Irish issue, issue. this is a global issue. I do think there is, um, there's this, this, it's better than it was a couple of years ago, but there's still a skills pipeline, right? So I like to say skills pipeline. I want to say skills gap is too negative. Okay. Pipeline is a positive thing. There is opportunity here, sure. and that's opportunity. Uh, I do think, um, so let, let's talk about education, and, and I'm not an academic, so this is just me talking from, from my own limited experience. Uh, the, the school, I did an interview on News Talk not too long ago when, when they were, when the Leaving Cert was coming mm -hmm. out. And so let, let's start there and move up, right? So I do think that what Pio had said earlier about the Leaving Cert process is true, that it's probably very objective, it, it, that it's, when it's very points-centric, it's fair. It doesn't matter if you're wealthy or not wealthy. If you want to be a doctor or whatever your objective is and you get those points, you got a fairly good shot. And it doesn't matter if your parents bought the East Wing yeah. or put a, you know, a plaque yeah. on a school somewhere, which sometimes could happen in America, right? So I do think that's great. I do think that it's very focused on memorization, rote learning. Mm -hmm. There's not enough emotional intelligence and cognitive thinking and external experience and things of that nature. So from... What I am kind of passionate about is trying to tweak that a little bit. And, and, I, and I, again, I don't have all the, all the answers, and it's just me talking in, in large pictures, which is easy. But the combination of the CIO points with um, continuous assessment, maybe weighted in a certain way, because some kids don't test well, mm -hmm. or some kids could have a terrible family experience, and then they got to go to take their, their test the next day. So that combined with... Um, uh, continuous assessment, which I think is where they're going in that direction, with some external stuff. Like, you know, what, what are you doing externally? Were you part of the school bank? Were you the captain of your team? Were you, you know, the best speller? Won a spelling bee, whatever. And, and so I think there's an integrated model there that would help. Second thing is I, I do think we need to tie industry closer to the schools. But when I say that, you also, you know, industry doesn't solve everything. Look, I think government needs to be government. We all give out about the government and complain or whatever, but government needs to be there to get certain things done, and they should be neutral from its industry. And we, you know, industry is profit driven. If you're not making money, you're not doing your job, right? That, that's all it is. You're making profit and money, right? And then the extra stuff, the CSR stuff, and all that, that comes from that. But that's day one. So, and academia is there to kind of educate you. Educate the kids, so it, they all need to be kind of separate, right? So when I say that, I'm not saying the industry should come in and buy the school and kind of run it because yeah. you don't want profit-driven people doing that because sometimes you get bad behavior that shouldn't mm -hmm. happen. But I do believe that uh, the industry will know who, what kind of skills they need and where they want to go. You know, CIT I think two years ago did a great job where they teamed with with you know companies like EMC and IBM. Um, to, to for the, the cloud computing, um, uh, first one on the planet, the MBA, cloud, uh, a master's in cloud computing, which got global recognition. 
So I do think we need to continue to do that. Some, some examples that we've done here in a limited scale is we, you know, we have the, um, and we're relaunching it again next week, we have our adopt a school program where we have co companies um, adopting schools and doing different things with them from a technology standpoint uh, and helping. Um, and we're seeing results with that. In fact, we started it in 2012 and in the 2014 action plan for jobs, um, it was mentioned that this model as a, a, as a framework for the a blueprint for the national framework. So that can help. Um, I do also, we're, we're, and again, this isn't like to give a laundry list of all the great things we're doing, it's just to give examples yeah. on yeah. how we need to do more of this type of stuff. Yeah. We're gonna deploy something called smartest placements in the autumn, where we're gonna place um, 100 transition year young women into IT companies for a week. So I do think the transition year um, type of model can be leveraged a little more. Uh, I do think industry should be working together helping develop stuff. Um, and I, I also think that um, the, the more we do that, the more comfortable everybody will be between industry and, and academia. Not that, that helps at all, but. Yeah, no, it's, a, it, it's an attractive vision, Dennis. I have a couple of questions for you. Weren't the other ones questions? <laughs> they were warmer up here. Okay. Um, who has been the biggest, or who has had, I should say, the biggest influence on your career to this point? Um, I think, you know, my parents uh, had an influence on, uh, influence on me in many ways. Um, my, my siblings and, and my, my, my brother-in-law, my, my older sister's um, husband, mm -hmm. a lot of influence. Um, I had um, a senior executive within the company who was my mentor mm -hmm. for many years. That, that helped me very much, uh, which is, is very important for a lot of people too, I'd also say, is you know, get a mentor, whether it be in a company or whatever, someone you can talk to that has experience that you don't. And don't be bashful about not, about asking people who, who have skills you don't, because that's what you really want. You don't want people who have your skills. You know, the, the, old, the older I got, the better I got at that. Mm. Um, I think um, in recent years, um, uh, a guy named Bob Savage from EMC, I th he was um, uh, voted most trusted manager there, about, about the leader executive about two years ago. Uh, when we started this vision of the tech cluster and how we can make a difference in the region, I was, you know, thick into IBM and, you know, in the media and branding and driving a, a global and, and pan-Europe uh, strategy and team and sat down with, with, with him and when we were very strong competitors. And, you know, I, I'm big into co-opetition in right. the global market. Sometimes you're the enemy, sometimes you're not. You got to find a way, you know, sometimes you're partnering with someone you're selling against That's next it. week and you got to figure out how to do all that. And, and I admire how he embraced, how he got that it was right for the region, how he got it was good for industry, and he understood how it would also be good for his own company and the, as well as the country. Um, and we, we figured out a way to, 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 you know, and there's many, many leaders yeah, like that, but so. he, he's one that, um, as well as a lot on his team, that... Um, uh, have been have been uh, significant influence to me and, and made a, made a very very positive impression. Great. Great to hear it. I wish we had more time, but our time has come. So I have one final question, and it is without doubt, or at least I think it's probably the hardest one you'll have to answer tonight. If you could only pick one. Is this the superhero thing they were no, talking no, about? No, 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 no. Somebody was telling me something no, about, no, say, no. Superman, so they put a cape on you, or no, no. Naomi Wright or something. Uh, yeah, no. Not this time. If you could only pick one, would you pick Cork winning the All-Ireland or the Yankees winning the World Series? Oh, come on. That's not fair. I know. That's why I'm asking you. Um, <laughs> both. Sure you answer that. Ah, that's not okay. Come on. I'm going to put you under pressure. You've got to give me something better than that. Why, why would How about this? How about if I paraphrase John F. Kennedy Go and say that I would root for the Yankees and pray for Cork? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gents, Kula Boss for Dennis Cotton. Thank you.